Hi, everybody. Are you enjoying brunch? Get a good, all right, we like brunch. Mimosas, Bloody Marys. It's just what you want when you're talking about gene therapy. They just go together, right? So we have the bells tolling outside. If we could maybe open that back door as well. We're gonna allow people to kind of come in and keep eating their, their brunches and you know keep enjoying and, and things will stay out there for a little bit. But we really wanna um, get this panel started because I wanna allow everybody ample time to get through their presentations. We have some wonderful uh, speakers today and we're gonna have a great moderated discussion at the end. And speaking of moderators, we have Dr. Jeffrey Chamberlain here. So we're, we're very glad to have him moderating our panel sharing his wisdom and we're gonna hear some from some wonderful companies in the gene therapy and gene editing space. So without further ado, here are our panelists for today. Give them a warm welcome. Let's do it. Okay, welcome everyone. I, I guess we can get started. Uh, so I'm Jeff Chamberlain. I'm going to do an introduction uh, to the session, just give you a brief overview of, of, of gene therapy, and then we'll move on to our panelists. So uh, let's see. I'm going to move over here to the middle. <laughs> the, oh. Okay, so again, yeah, I'm Jeff Chamberlain. I'm at the University of Washington, and uh, my laboratory is focused on trying to develop gene therapy, which is what we're gonna hear about today. So I thought I would start off by giving you a very brief introduction to what is gene therapy, and, and gene therapy is really just the concept of using genes or genetic material as a form of medicine. Uh, the idea is to deliver a new gene to the body or to directly implant or uh, manipulate the structure or the function of a gene. Uh, Defining exactly what is, counts as gene therapy and what doesn't is, is a little tricky, but in general, there are four types of gene therapy I think most people agree on. Uh, the most common one is re sometimes referred to as gene replacement therapy. Uh, that's the process of delivering a new gene to the body, and that, for example, is what uh, is being used with uh, AAV vectors, as we're going to hear a lot about, in order to deliver uh, uh, microdystrophin genes for uh, gene therapy of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There's several other approaches to gene therapy for muscular dystrophy. Uh, there's a method of gene modification where you're not actually manipulating a gene itself, but you're modifying the uh, products that come off of that gene. And an example of that are the exon skipping therapies that uh, are already approved uh, for some mutations in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, methods that are a little more in development, uh, one of which is that we're going to hear about today is gene editing. Uh, this is an approach to try to directly repair or, or permanently modify the structure of a gene in order to improve its function. Uh, and that's uh, commonly referred to as CRISPR, sometimes CRISPR-Cas9, something that many of you maybe have heard about in, in the media. And then the final approach is referred to as gene knockdown, where you're actually trying to inactivate a mutant gene that is doing more harm than good. It's making a toxic gene product. So a brief history of gene therapy. Gene therapy is a concept that was first proposed uh, almost 40 years ago, but it's taken quite a long time to bring it into the clinic. However, there are uh, many different gene therapy trials going on and several approved gene therapies uh, uh, in the United States. The, the first gene therapy that was approved as a drug by the Food and Drug Administration happened back in 2017. And this was uh, an approach where uh, genes were used to modify immune cells uh, in, in the blood for treatment of uh, bloodborne cancers like uh, lymphoma. Uh, the second gene therapy and the first one that was approved using a, a direct a body delivery of a, of a vector and a new gene was uh, known as Luxturna. This was a gene therapy that is used to treat a form of inherited blindness and, and that's the first approved gene therapy that uses these so-called AAV vectors that are of, of great interest for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, soon after that, the first gene therapy for a neuromuscular disorder was approved by the FDA. This is Zolgemza. Uh, it was approved back in 2019, and uh, the, this treatment is a little more similar to what's uh, being attempted to be done with uh, muscular dystrophy. This involves taking an AAV delivery shuttle or a delivery vector uh, and infusing it directly into the bloodstream in order to target uh, neural tissues throughout the body, and that's being used for uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy. 
Uh, currently, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different gene therapy trials ongoing uh, worldwide for a variety of different uh, disorders. Uh, many of them are inherited disorders, uh, but also a, a lot of acquired disorders, particularly cancer. Uh, and and the, these AAV vectors are, are the most commonly used gene delivery system in order to uh, send a new vector or send a new gene back into the body. Uh, AAV has a number of advantages. There's many different types of AAV, and different ones often can target different tissues. There are certain ones that seem to work quite well in muscle and others that work well in other tissues. Uh, they have an advantage in that they tend to enter cells and drop off their gene payload without modifying the uh, existing DNA in the cell, so you don't have to worry about uh, messing up something that you didn't intend to do. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different types of AAVs, and some of them are particularly good at targeting muscle. Some of them are not, but there are fortunately a number of different types of AAV that are very good at getting into muscle. So what are some of the challenges of applying these gene therapy technologies to Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And, and, and what we're going to hear about today is, is going to address some of these challenges. The, probably the initial challenge was the size of the gene. So the, the dystrophin gene that is defective in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the largest gene in nature. It's, it's uh, certainly much bigger than any other gene that's been found, and, and that causes a lot of problems. It makes it difficult to work with. It's probably also one of the reasons that Duchenne muscular dystrophy is one of the most common inherited disorders. Uh, and the, even the coding region of the gene, which is only a small part of the entire gene, is too big to fit into the so-called AAV delivery vectors. Uh, this little cartoon here in, in blue uh, at, the, at the top of the screen is, is a little representation of the different uh, functional pieces that make up the dystrophin protein. Uh, and, but one of the interesting things that was identified uh, nearly 30 years ago, actually by Kate Davies lab at, at Oxford University, is that some patients that have milder forms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, in other words, the Becker muscular dystrophy, actually make very small proteins. So occasionally they have uh, the mutation in their gene removes a very large segment of the gene and leads to the production of a small protein. And in particular, there is one patient that's uh, very well known in, 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 the, in the research field among those that work on this disease. Uh, it was a patient that had an incredibly mild form of Becker muscular dystrophy. And this individual, the mutation in their gene uh, removed over half of the dystrophin gene, and yet this individual uh, was able to remain walking until uh, age 78 when he eventually uh, uh, passed away. So this observation that you could take out half of the gene and still have a pretty functional protein was, was, was really astounding, and it uh, paved the way for uh, future development of, uh, uh, of smaller genes that are designed in the laboratory synthetic genes, and these are the ones that are moving, or that are currently being tested in the clinic, and, and that's illustrated at the bottom of the slide here. Again, there's a little cartoon there of the full dystrophin protein, and the one below that, the smaller one, shows what's missing in that individual. So that, that information uh, spurred uh, uh, research in many different laboratories, including mine, to see if we could come up with ways to make even smaller dystrophins, but also while making them smaller, could they be made more functional? Uh, one of the problems is that even though these small dystrophin proteins work quite well, none of them really work as well as the full protein. But in, if, until we can figure out a way to deliver the full protein, we try to work with small proteins that are as functional as possible. And, and again, this is a little cartoon here. It's a sort of different color pattern. But it, the, the, the top uh, line there just shows uh, some of the different uh, uh, subpieces or domains of the dystrophin protein uh, and a little bit of what they do. Right below that, where it says BMD, delta exon 17 to 48, that is the protein that was predicted to be be made in this very mildly affected individual. Uh, so people started from that. We started redesigning that protein and found we could actually make it a little smaller uh, and make a more stable and a more functional protein, and that spurred further modifications of the protein. And, and further down on there, if, if you can see these purple lines, uh, led to a variety of testings of removing more of that central piece of the dystrophin protein. And then later on, uh, we realized that we could also remove the very end of the protein that's indicated on this slide as the CT domain, uh, which, which turned out to be critical because without both of those further modifications, uh, we would still not have a way to deliver these proteins uh, back in the muscle. And at the very bottom of the slide, or the bottom three lines, just show three different types of these so-called microdystrophins. 
which are the functional proteins that are small enough to be delivered by these AAV vectors. There's a lot of different versions of them. Uh, many people are still kind of tweaking the structure of these microdystrophins to try to bring out as much functional activity as possible while leaving the proteins small enough to be delivered by AAV vectors. And, and there's probably been uh, uh, almost 40 different microdystrophins designed over the years, uh, but currently only, only a few of those are in clinical trials because some of them work a lot better than others. Uh, what's shown here on this slide is the current uh, uh, state of, of uh, development where uh, showing three different vectors that are currently in clinical trials. The top one is being used by Pfizer in, in, in a Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene therapy trial. The middle one is the, uh, the vector that Sarepta is testing, and the bottom one is being tested by Solid Biosciences. And again, there are several other companies getting ready to jump in and test even, even a wider variety of these constructs. The, the differences, each one is a little bit different. So there's pros and cons of each one. And, and one of the an advantage of testing several different ones is we can learn a lot from the different trials and hopefully use that information to come back and reiteratively design newer vectors. Uh, there's two different uh, types of AAV being used. Two of the trials are using so-called AAV9. Uh, SREPT is using an AAV RH74. Uh, all of them, you have an on-off switch to synthetically uh, uh, allow the gene to be turned on in muscle cells but not be turned on in liver cells, for example. Uh, and then there are three different microdystrophins that are being tested. So, so we'll see how uh, all, all these trials uh, come along. So some of the remaining challenges or current challenges, remaining challenges, as I mentioned, the size of the dystrophin gene was, was a real problem. We've largely gotten around that, although there are still methods being developed to, to deliver larger and larger dystrophins. Uh, hopefully that'll come online in the next few years. Uh, tissue targeting was important to make sure we only make dystrophin in muscle. Uh, but some of the challenges that, that we're still dealing with are the dose. Uh, muscle tissue is almost half of the human body, so that's a huge target area to deliver new genes into. Uh, what's the durability going to be? Uh, these gene therapies are probably not likely to last forever. Uh, maybe the gene editing, the CRISPR approach as well, but, but the gene replacement is, we don't know how long it's going to last. Will it last five years? Will it last 10 years? Will it last 15? That's going to come out of these trials, hopefully. Uh, and then the other problem is that uh, some patients uh, have been exposed to AAV earlier in their life and are immune to the vectors and they can't be used. Uh, so a lot of the things that's coming out of the trials are, are to address this dose response, the safety of these vectors, uh, what can we learn about how functional they are, and uh, what's the risk-benefit ratio in these trials. Uh, so despite uh, these challenges and hurdles, I think we're lear learning a lot. Uh, the, the trials are, are coming along uh, uh, pretty well, in my opinion, and, and the patients that have been treated are, 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 do are doing, doing, doing well, certainly uh, better than uh, other approaches that are out there. There are some hiccups that have been encountered along the way. There's a couple of serious adverse events that have been seen. In particular, just over the last year, five patients have developed uh, an immune response against dystrophin, so the body views it as a foreign protein, and they're trying to clear it out of the body. Uh, this is something that presents as initially as muscle weakness. Uh, it's, it's treatable with immune suppressive strategies, and the patients that have had these issues have, have, have recovered and, and are doing pretty well. And, and one of the good things that's come out of this is that the different companies that are involved in these trials have joined forces and are, and are really uh, doing a lot of work to try to find out what was the cause of this and what can be done to uh, further improve the safety. And, and, and there's a working group led by Karsten Bonneman and Francesco Montoni that are looking at this in a lot of detail. So the final thing I'm going to say is that, again, this is just another way to represent the dystrophin protein. Down at, at the bottom of it, it gets a little complicated. It shows uh, uh, which parts of the protein are present in the different vectors from the different companies that are doing these trials. But the, 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 the bottom line is that it looks so far that there's only a very small small piece of dystrophin that has uh, proven to be reactive that's causing these immune system problems. And uh, we need to find out exactly what that par portion of the protein is. And with that information, hopefully we can kind of engineer around that and, and, and uh, get away from these issues. So I'm going to, I guess, uh, turn things over. Do we have a video from Carson Bonneman that's going to explain the, uh, uh, the approach to dealing with these serious adverse events in a little more detail? So um, what happened? There was a small but st distinct subset of patients in, uh, in the clinical trials that appeared to have an immune reaction against the delivered microdystrophin proteins, against the transgene. And that, and we we'll described that in a little better detail in the, um, in the coming slide. Um, but it was uh, across different trials. So again, with different capsids, different promoters, different microdystrophin, versions 
um, that uh, still developed a common reaction against this microdystrophin that was delivered. And it resulted in inflammation of the muscle, myositis, and in some cases also inflammation of the heart, called myocarditis. So in, in total, this was observed in uh, five patients uh, across three different clinical trials. We can see the age range here from seven to nine. Uh, and there's a range of different doses that you, um, from these, these doses uh, uh, are not in exactly comparable between trials because the titering methods are somewhat different, but you can see it is over a wide range of different doses given. And so um, the conclusion from that is that there is no relationship to the specific agent, so the specific capsid, the specific promoter, was a specific microdystrophin. And yet there was something in common to, um, to these five subjects in all three clinical trials that we have to understand and, uh, and that'll be coming up in the next uh, few slides. Um, Francesco is gonna describe what happened clinically. Yeah, so um, I think as, as uh, I, I, and I suppose one of the reason why uh, with Carsten um, and the all companies agreed to speak is that it was clear that this may well be a problem unrelated to any particular, um, uh, if you like, specific microdystrophin use, but at the same time was something that all the companies have in common. But what was in common was the, the fact that this patient had a, a striking, uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. no. Okay. Yeah, I can't so see it. <laughs> the, uh, there's, anyway, the, the, uh, there was a striking similar event, and I think this is important to realize the time course of this event was uh, between 24 and 42 days after dosing. And this was, is important because that is at the time when the promoter, as uh, Constance suggested, will start to drive significant expression of the protein dystrophin. The virus is there from day one, the viral vector, but this protein takes time to be produced. What happened was that these people developed a significant muscle weakness, but also with quite an unusual pattern uh, of distribution, in particular, voice and swallowing muscle became affected. And as you are aware, these are not common things we see in people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but was also a common thread between these different uh, uh, young people. Heart involvement by uh, at least lab testing was observed also um, one week later in three of these patients. And um, this uh, followed the skeletal muscle involvement. Importantly, this, this line says that there were no problems with kidney, liver, platelets, or complement. And I think for those who understand or have been exposed to AV adverse event, this is, indicates that something different from what we had experienced before uh, was noticed. And multiple treatments were required. Some of these individuals required to be ventilated. Cardiac medication were required. And um, in a variable way, depending on the site of subject, uh, different immunosuppression regime were used. Uh, but I think importantly, these, all these uh, young people uh, improve after this quite scaring, quite frankly, uh, event. Uh, next slide. So they, um, um, we had to understand what um, was really happening that's common to all of these patients, um, and that is common to all agents that were in clinic. And so the hypothesis is um, that this immune attack is directed against the region of the microdystrophins um, that is present in all the microdystrophins, and that the a patient immune system did not recognize as self um, because that region is missing from the patient's protein repertoire because of the underlying genetic mutation. So let's see um, what, what that means. Um, so again, this is um, a, a cartoon um, that we showed before. And again, we're um, pointing this out because it shows the region uh, that are common to all the microdystrophins that are in clinical use at the moment. There had to be something in common between them because it's not, uh, it's not agent specific. It's not, uh, 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 transgene specific or uh, uh, compound specific or AAV specific. 
the um, uh, deletions, the an underlying mutation that the patients with the um, uh, events had are very informative. Um, so what you see here is a, a cartoon of where the deletion, so the lack of genetic material was in the patients who experienced these adverse events versus patients here that, oops, that did not. And what you can see here, the patients um, with, this, uh, with these adverse events all had deletions of genetic material that overlaps with the protein uh, parts, the uh, genetic material that's now delivered with the different microdystrophin transgenes. As opposed to patients who have loss of genetic material that occurs in region of the dystrophin gene that is not represented in the microdystrophin transgenes, uh, none of these patients experienced anything uh, like these adverse events. Um, in fact, they had no myositis and no myocarditis, none of them. So it really all comes down to this region um, of the protein um, that is delivered by the transgene and is deleted in the genetic background of the patients. So I, I think that the, the um, this summarized now not in a visual way, but with uh, um, fact, in writing what Carsten has just indicated. So it looks as there was something in, uh, yeah, it looks as there was something uh, common, uh, and this was the type of um, deletion and that part of the dystrophin protein that was missing in this patient. And therefore, uh, the overarching hypothesis is that there was a immune reaction against the um, part of the microdystrophin that the individual people with this particular type of deletions did not recognize, they'd never seen that before uh, because of their in the underlying mutation. And in a way, the concept that we recognize uh, in other conditions um, that it was a no novel concept uh, in, the, in the Duchenne field is the possibility that uh, these people receive, having this particular complication may have a kind of rejection, rejection not very different from what happens after organ transplantation. Jeff. <laughs> okay. So uh, now we're going to move on to a presentation by the companies involved in, in gene therapy trials, either current or planned. Uh, so I forgot who the first speaker was going to be. Thank you. There you go. Thank you so much. So I think I'll advance. So, hello everyone. I'm Jennifer Hodge. I'm the team lead for the Rare Neurology U.S. Medical Affairs Group at Pfizer, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you this weekend and live. Uh, I'm an immunologist by training, and I wanted to walk you through a little bit about our phase three trial that's beginning here in the US. So we are starting the global phase three multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study to assess the safety and efficacy of our mini dystrophin gene therapy, otherwise known as fortidistrogene movaparvivec. And I know we spoke uh, to the Kirgishan community in April to let you know that we were coming to the US. And then we had a webinar with Deborah on May 11th. And now I was gonna walk you through a little bit more of some of the details. As well as I'll mention at the end, I'm at the exhibit booth number 15 in the back and I'm here till eight o'clock to answer any questions. So this is my disclosure slide. Uh, nothing exciting other than everything I'm going to be talking about is an investigational compound under phase three clinical trial now in the US and outside the US. Uh, Dr. Chamberlain did a great introduction to gene therapy, so I won't spend much time on this, but just to remind you in our particular program, what we're talking about is AAV gene transfer therapy. And so it's a copy of a working gene that gets transferred in. And the way we do that is to package it into a vehicle called a vector. And so on the schematic on the bottom, you can see the little piece of DNA with the gene underneath, the vector that we make the package, that's the gene and the vector, and that gets infused into the body, usually IV in the arm, 
and that vector carries the transgene to the target muscle, target tissue, cells of interest. I like to say that the vector has the GPS and the gene has the instructions. So it will go to the muscle cell, skeletal and cardiac, and it will use that cell machinery to make the missing protein, in our case, the dystrophin. When Dr. Chamberlain talked about dystrophin, I think he gave a great example. I just wanted to explain our packaging, if you will. We're using the recombinant AAV9 vector as our vehicle, and we're putting in a mini dystrophin, as exemplified by the red box. The instructions for this are the blue and green boxes. And like Dr. Chamberlain said, the full-length dystrophin is enormous. It is way too big to fit into our vehicle. So as he mentioned, that 78-year-old Becker muscular dystrophy patient and family has been our guide to most of our companies about how do we design something smaller that can fit in. And you'll see that at the bottom. Pfizer's mini dystrophin is the truncated one, where we knew that centerpiece was not required, but we knew the bits on the left and right, based on the Becker, were required. A little bit about our study design. Our design uh, schematic is here. We're called Cifrio. And our goal is to enroll approximately 100 eligible boys, ambulatory. They'll be randomized, which means none of us know what groups they'll go into in a two to one ratio. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. All participants, all boys, have to be followed for approximately five years. And this is to monitor their safety, their health and well being, as well as their efficacy through different assessments. And our primary endpoint is the baseline at week 52, the change from baseline, excuse me, in the NSAA. And we'll talk a little bit about the three portions of the study, which are the main study, the delayed treatment, and the follow-up periods. So in the study treatment period, I talked about two groups and approximately 100 boys. If enrolled, if eligible, your child will be placed into group one or group two. Again, this is randomized. None of us know what's being um, put into which group. Approximately two-thirds of the boys will go into group one, and this means they immediately at dosing will receive the gene therapy. The remaining approximately 33 or so boys will go into group two, and at that time they will get the placebo. As I'll show you in the next schematic, after a year, we do a swap. So those boys that got the gene therapy will now get placebo for a year, and those boys that had placebo at the beginning will now get the gene therapy. So by the end of the duration of the two-year period, all boys will have gotten the gene therapy. It's important to remember that the background steroids that we'll talk a little bit about have to be a stable regimen for approximately three months before and during that duration of two-year study period. After that, you can work with your physician and your clinical trial team to adjust if necessary. A couple more details we thought you might be interested in, in hearing about. What we call the screening period is before the dosing, and that can be anywhere from one to three months before, where really the team is doing all the lab work, all that eligibility work to make sure that this is the appropriate treatment for your boy, that all of the assessments have done, think about liver, white blood cells, everything is kosher so that we can go into this program. The long-term follow-up period, just as important. We need to monitor and get that data to understand over time his health, his well-being, any safety events and efficacy assessments. All that data is critically important and you'll find in the next couple slides those visits are incredibly important for all of us. And just to remember, we do have the delayed dosing. That just means we swap after a year. At the end of two years, all boys that are enrolled will have received the gene therapy. A little bit about visits, because I know this has been a question, especially at the exhibit table. It may look like a lot, and I'll show you the schematic, approximately 49. But the way it's structured, if you think about it, most of the visits are in that first two years. When you're talking about dosing, you really want to do your visits before and extremely after because that's the critical time where we want to keep an eye on things. As time goes on, visits will become increasingly um, move along and less frequent. And so we can think about what that means for travel, etc. The other important piece to know about our trial is in that first week after dosing, 
we will be hospitalizing the boys. So for seven days, they will stay in the hospital immediately after dosing. The second week, we're asking you to stay at the site. So stay near there so we can, again, continue that careful monitoring. After that, many of the assessments will be done either outpatient or even at your home. And so there's the, frequent, the opportunity to then go home. So what does it look like in terms of for you and your schedule? Brief schematic, I have more detail and I can answer any questions. But in the pink, this is the main study phase. The screening is all the work we do to see whether you're appropriate. The baseline visits before dosing, that's when we do all the testing right before. That includes the neutralizing antibody test. Pfizer has its own neutralizing antibody test. It's gonna be a simple base, you know, blood draw, get shipped out, and we get to find out whether you're positive or negative for the neutralizing AAV9. After dosing, remember those first two weeks are really important for all of us. First week will be in the hospital for careful monitoring. Second week will be close to the site. And then as you can see, the visits will go three month three, maybe one to two weeks, then every one to three months. At the end of one year, when we do the swap, we repeat that pattern. And then the long-term follow-up for three to four years, maybe a couple visits, once every six months. When we talk about the trial, we need to talk about the patients, the boys, and what does eligibility, inclusion, meaning you can be in it, or exclusion, meaning at this time, snapshot in time, in this particular trial, we would exclude. So for inclusion, the boys need to be between the ages of four and seven, so right before their eighth birthday. They need to have a confirmed genetic diagnosis of Duchenne. They need to be ambulatory, and we wanna make sure they're on that stable daily dose of steroids for at least three months beforehand. Exclusion. If you have a positive test for the neutralizing antibody to AAV9, you will be unfortunately excluded. And as an immunologist, I can say this is for your, their own personal safety. That's your immune response saying invader. And that's the last thing we wanna do when we're bringing an AAV9 therapy to the boy. We don't want it to be seen as an invader. Any abnormalities in those laboratory testing, think white blood cells, liver enzymes, we wanna make sure that's all in the clear. So if it's not, we would exclude. And the last thing, if they had been on any treatments that increase their dystrophin, that would also lead to an exclusion because we need to know whether we have an intervening efficacy. I wanna finish with a couple of things on how to find out more. I know this was a six minute, maybe seven minute quick overview. We have a Cifrio website, we have a 1-800 number, we have an email. My medical team is here at the exhibit, we'll be here all day, please come up. I will answer all and every question. If I don't know the answer, I will find someone that does. As well, Nicola Garnier, I can't see what the lights is here in the audience somewhere. Put your hand up, back table. He's my guru, my patient advocacy lead. He also is happy to answer any and all questions. And of course, Deborah and the Cure Duchenne group know how to find us. And I'd like to just end with our sincere, sincere thanks for your patience, your time with us. We are thrilled to be here. I worked on gene therapy back in the 90s at UPenn. I've been waiting 30 years for this stage. So we're here, we're thrilled to be here, and we couldn't do it without you all. So thank you so much. Hello everybody, I'm happy to be here with you again today to talk about our gene therapy programs here at Sarepta. These are our forward-looking statements again. Um, so here's our clinical development program. Um, we have four studies that are currently active and, and some of them are still enrolling. Um, study 101, 102, and 103 were part of our phase one and two programs. Um, among these three studies, we have enrolled over 80 patients of varying ages, anywhere from three to the age of 19, both ambulatory, non-ambulatory, weights up to 80 kilograms. So we have a, a vast amount of experience um, through these three programs. Embark is our phase three study that we're currently enrolling in the US as well as globally. We'll talk more specifically about that particular test. 
very exciting. I'm happy to say that our Envision study, we like Ease, Endeavor, Embark, and Envision. Um, that will be our non-ambulatory and older ambulatory individuals, and we are anticipating to start enrolling in that trial in the second half of this year. So let me speak specifically about Embarks, and that's in the here and now. This is our phase three study. Like I said, it's enrolling in the US as well as in Europe. Some of the key inclusion criteria, now this isn't everything, but it's some of the highlights. We're looking for boys ages four um, to less than eight. Um, they have to have the mutation as was pointed out in a specific region. So with those earlier exons of one to 17, those are unfortunately excluded at this time. They do need to be ambulatory on a stable dose of steroids, of daily steroids prior to. And then um, as was mentioned before, we do have our own RH74 antibody test that has to be done so that we can make sure that there's not too many antibodies that can block that gene um, from getting into the muscle cell. Um, some of the key exclusion criteria is that they couldn't have had any other cell-based therapy or gene therapies um, prior to going in. If, it's a, if there is a boy who is currently on any other dystrophin-producing medications, like exon skipping, we do have to have a washout of about six months. And a very similar trial design than what Jen described with the Pfizer trial, um, we look to enroll about 120 participants across the globe. Um, randomly, they will be assigned to receive either the 9001 therapy or they'll be on placebo the first year. Then after year one is concluded, we'll switch and those patients who were on placebo will then receive the 9001 treatment. And they will be followed for at least five years in an observational long-term extension. As of May 16th, these were the sites that were activated and starting to enroll in the United States. There have been updates to this, so I encourage you to go to clinicaltrials.gov. You can search Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You can put in Embark, and it will bring up the trial. You can click on the trial and scroll down, and it will show you all of the currently activated sites. We just couldn't keep the slide um, without having to, to redo it every time. So as of May 16th, that's what it looks like. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, there's a number of ways to keep in touch with us. Our wonderful patient advocacy team is here. You can go by our booth and you can stop and talk to them. You can also reach out to them via email at advocacy at sarepta.com. You can go to duchenne.com where there's resources and more um, information available to you. We have a very cool YouTube channel where we produced a number of GTFAQ videos where we talk about some of the really basic things about gene therapy to just introduce that language to you. And then at our booth, as well as online, we have our very nice um, patient educational brochure that's there for you. And that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. It is me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Morris. I'm the, the Chief Scientific Officer for Solid Biosciences. Uh, Forward-looking statement. Uh, so as Jeff, Jeff uh, uh, mentioned, uh, there's uh, a number of ways that you can package a microdystrophin or, or, or a, a, a shortened version of the dystrophin into to the AAV. And so we uh, uh, selected a, a route based on Jeff Chamberlain's work, actually, uh, to, to include what uh, we think is sort of a, a potential differentiator, uh, the NNOS binding domain. Uh, so the NNOS is recruited to the, the membrane, a, a protein, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, recruited to the membrane uh, by dystrophin, and it, at, it then enables potentially uh, improved blood flow. And so some of the functional ischemia that, that the boys see when they're active and the fatigue, uh, we, we hope that this may be sort of reduced uh, uh, with, with our construct. So we were in the clinic with uh, what we called Ignite DMD. It was a phase one, two uh, open label study that, that we ultimately enrolled nine, uh, 12 patients and dosed nine. We uh, decided earlier this year uh, to, to uh, uh, conclude enrollment, um, and for, for a good reason, not a bad reason. Uh, so it ultimately ended up that, that uh, you know, three boys were dosed at a lower dose, 
And then when we identified that, that that wasn't what we felt sufficient in terms of efficacy, we increased the dose to the 2E14 where we, uh, we started identifying efficacy and I'll show you some, some of those data. Um, they, we did enroll, our first patient was non-ambulant um, and then we transitioned uh, based on a number of uh, uh, things to just uh, focusing on the ambulant, the younger pet population of four to 11. But the hope is uh, as we sort of uh, continue with the program, this program and other, uh, another program, um, that, that we'll uh, get back into the non-ambulance as soon as possible. Um, so really the, the study summary is, is there uh, uh, for viewing. We did have safety findings and everyone's aware of that. Gene therapy, what we're doing is delivering a, a, a ton of AAV, just where we're, we're sort of inundating uh, the, the body with a lot of virus. And, and so you, you anticipate there are gonna be uh, uh, um, you know, potential safety th uh, uh, findings. And so really what we saw in, in most of the patients was sort of nausea, vomiting, um, and a little bit of fever over the first few days. Uh, less common really was what we, we identified and, and, and has seen, uh, been seen by others is, is really this uh, complement mediated response. Uh, and, and it happens very, very um, uh, in a scheduled manner. We can sort of watch what's going to happen and, and sort of monitor it and manage it, which I think is a really good thing. And, and, and a number of companies are, are sort of really thinking about this a lot more. We decided in our risk mitigation to, to include a complement inhibitor uh, called ecoluzumab. Um, uh, and prophylactically use that to try and sort of dampen the potential response uh, coming from, from delivery of the AV. We did have the, the three serious as, uh, adverse events, SAEs, um, but, but uh, based on, on how we mitigated that, the, the, the FDA was, was uh, uh, okay and our, our safety monitoring board that we have uh, was okay in, in sort of uh, um, allowing us to move forward. No, nothing has been seen after about 90 days. So the, the issue with gene therapy is you have an exceptionally high dose at the beginning, and then it, 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 it gradually goes away. And after about 90 days, nothing really has been uh, observed uh, in, in our study. So uh, one of the, the, the main things is can we get uh, the, the microdystrophin to the right place um, and expressing, uh, expressing appropriately. And so in our, in our patients, I sort of highlighted on the left there, is uh, looking at uh, both three month and then also longer term data that, that we're seeing. And, and, and what we're, we're, we're looking at here, after two years, we actually still see uh, observable uh, microdystrophin expression in, in the, the biopsies of the boys. And, and due to COVID, we have a 24-month uh, biopsy. Um, our uh, below level of uh, quantitation, which is a BLQ, is 5%. But when you, look at the West, uh, when you look at the image, you can actually see the band is there, um, and, and it sort of uh, matches up to, to about the, the 10 to 30% that we're seeing in positive fibers. But, but we're, we're hopeful that the durability is there, um, and this sort of gives us, gives us that, that hope. Uh, so this is just a, a panel showing that we're now out to two years in, in uh, our three boys, uh, our, our patients four to six at the high dose. Uh, they were about eight years on eight and a half years on average when, when uh, they, they were dosed. And you can see, basically, if you just sort of look across, they're generally doing, doing sort of a, a, about the same as they were over two years ago, or about two years ago which is a good thing. So looking at six minute walk uh, uh, and pulmonary function as well as the North Star and, and also a, a, a patient reported outcome measure called PODC that, that is sort of evaluating quality of life. There's really sort of a, a, a promising and, and uh, 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 view of the world uh, when you, you see this slide, uh, the, the clinical benefits there. So really uh, the, the totality of all the data really sort of is that, that uh, the, the the biopsies look good, they're, they're uh, durable, and then also some of the, the clinical, clinical measures that we get in a very small uh, number of patients are looking promising. And so we think that our microdystrophin SGT001 uh, should be sort of moved forward. And, and the goal right now is to, we sort of shifted from, from one process to another, and so now we have to sort of go back. We think that the, the reason we sort of stopped the, the enrollment overall was to really sort of uh, uh, get, uh, accelerate on the back end um, and I think it's sort of important that, that we uh, um, uh, get to the ability to sort of commercialize and, and approve the drug as opposed to sort of uh, uh, work on a method that, that may ultimately be better. But we want to try and get, get to the patients as soon as possible. I just want to highlight in, in, a, in a couple of slides uh, some work. We have another program that we call SGT, uh, excitingly, SGT003. Um, and and, it, and we're, we're transitioning that to the clinic as soon as possible as well. 
this is using the exact same microdystrophin that we, we have in, in the 001 program, but we, we've, we've sort of uh, identified a novel capsid that improves tropism, uh, uh, so uptake into the muscle by about twofold, um, and in mice and now non-human primates. And so I really wanted to just highlight it overall. This is a, a, a data from a non-human primate study that, that we uh, just completed, and versus AV9, which is what we're using now, we get about a twofold uh, up, uh, improved uptake in, in the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and also importantly, we're actually uh, reducing uh, uptake into the liver uh, by about half, so, so it gives us a, a better opportunity to, to uh, sort of provide what we think is a good microdystrophin construct uh, uh, into, in, into the boys. And so uh, hopefully that will be uh, in the clinic as well next year. So really overall, uh, you know, what, what we're thinking is we have two programs. We're using the, the, the microdystrophin uh, that we, we think is differentiated, uh, and, and, but we now ta take it in with sort of the, the first generation, uh, AV9 native um, capsid, and now with uh, the, the novel capsid in, in uh, SGT003 uh, to, to tr potentially sort of improve uh, um, the, the opportunities there with, with uh, clinical efficacy as well. We're also still uh, uh, focusing on the immunosuppression strategies given, given it's a, a massively high dose of AAV and we need to, to be there as well as sort of uh, 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 trying to develop our own natural history study to, to obtain some uh, internal data uh, so we can sort of use that to, to better support future studies. For that, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olivier Danos. Uh, it's a privilege to be here today and, and uh, present to you, um, if I can advance that, yes, our Regenex Bios uh, uh, program for gene therapy of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and uh, the, the product uh, candidate is called RGX202. This is my forward looking statements. And uh, again, we're uh, here. Again, using AAV, uh, we're, we're using AAV of uh, the serotype 8 because uh, we know that this is a very efficient vector capsid for uh, reaching the muscle and, and, and bringing uh, therapeutic cargo into the muscle and the heart. And it's been utilized in uh, numerous clinical trials and we also have large commercial scale uh, production systems at the company for this vector. Uh, we package in the vector yet another version of the microdystrophin, which looks a lot like the one that have been presented before with the uh, 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 differences that I will highlight. It's driven by a synthetic muscle-specific and heart-specific promoter called SPC512. And we've taken care to uh, engineer the sequence in order to remove certain uh, certain sequences, short, short CPG nucleotides that uh, uh, as, as much as we can because those uh, signals are known to uh, trigger immunity. Um, and we've also optimized the way the coding of this protein is made by the DNA in order to uh, enhance the, the, the quantity of protein that, 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 that can be made. So again, this is back to the uh, microdystrophin uh, design. Uh, on, the, on the left, you see the full-length microdystrophin. On the right, the shortened microdystrophin here. And again, I'm not going to go back in what my other colleagues have described before. Just want to make the point here that we've uh, added back here uh, a portion of the C-terminal, which has been removed from all the other microdystrophins, because we believe it can bring further uh, function to the, to the microdystrophin, and we have evidence for that. Uh, so our microdystrophin is a bit longer. It contains more information at the C-terminal, and it, uh, uh, it, 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 it facilitates the, the, the formation of the complex, protein complex, which is formed there. Uh, so what, with this construct, we've uh, obtained uh, a number of preclinical evidence that, that, that are all in our you know, IND submission. Uh, we've done pharmacology study using the MDX mice. Uh, we've done, we've then moved into uh, non-human primates where we've run our safety and pharmacology studies. Uh, so we see basically a very robust microdystrophin expression in the muscle and the, and, and the heart. Uh, we see a, a very high level of restoration of the, the complex, that, uh, the protein complex that, that associates with the dystrophin normally. And this, this translates into 
uh, much improvement of muscle function, uh, of, uh, sorry, a decrease in the pathology, in the inflammation, in the degeneration figures, in, in the fibrosis, and uh, significant improvement in the muscle function as measured by strength or, strength or gait analysis. So this leads us to uh, our uh, clinical trial. This is the, we, we've, uh, we, we now have an open IND, and we're uh, working at uh, including our first patient uh, so, so somewhere, somewhere this year. Uh, we have, uh, so this is uh, basically the, the, the trial design. I, I, I'm not going to take much time to describe that here, but uh, we target uh, ambulatory boys. Uh, that between the age of four and, and 11. Uh, we uh, restrict the trial, this trial, to the population with mutations between exon 18 and 58 for all the, the reasons which have been discussed before as well. And obviously, we screen our patients uh, for the absence of anti av 8 antibodies before they can be included. Um, so that's pretty much where, where we are. Uh, of course, the support of the community is uh, paramount for us, and uh, thank you for uh, listening. Um, so again, I'm Reed Clark, uh, Chief Scientific Officer at uh, Arthrogenics Gene Therapy, and uh, I'll be talking about our UX810 microdisc program. Um, here's the uh, obligatory forward-looking statements disclaimer. Um, so today, I'll briefly introduce UX810 uh, and, and talk about our areas of focus as we approach clinical trials with the Duchenne community. Um, so as you've heard, we're, we're utilizing AAV. We're delivering a microdystrophin. Actually, the microdystrophin is, is licensed from solid biosciences in terms of the construct design. Uh, and the question becomes, why now? Um, so the, the answer is, I think, as you've heard from Dr. Chamberlain and, and really the panelists, uh, we're still learning uh, tremendously from these clinical trials. And so the concept here that we're trying to pursue is leveraging both clinical learnings, learnings uh, in immunology, um, learnings of AV biology, and also as we move forward uh, with iterative improvements in manufacturing. So we're trying to bring that together so we can actually, um, you know, we believe bring a product, a therapy forward that would benefit uh, the wider Duchenne community. So just talking about areas of focus, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, one key area is minimizing adverse events and ensuring the safety profile for UX810, as we've heard. Uh, today, you know, um, uh, uh, we're, we're investing significant preclinical research activities in, in really immune modulation to blunt those anti capsid immune responses that Dr. Morris talked about, and then also um, immune regimens that could uh, interfere and blunt anti microdystrophin transgene responses. So uh, again, the hope is that we can develop these regimens and actually incorporate them into our clinical trial for a protocol. Uh, the other uh, area, second area, is enhanced administration and delivery uh, for optimal dosing. And so again, with an eye towards exploring agents to increase vascular egress of the particle for higher transduction, better biodistribution into the underlying skeletal and cardiac muscle. And we're also uh, performing uh, studies as, as really the field is, is moving uh, rapidly forward to look at strategies to really uh, allow uh, dosing in the face of neutralizing antibodies. Obviously, these are preclinical studies, but again, those strategies are obviously critically important for so many patients that, you know, fail the inclusion criteria, as we've heard, around neutralizing antibodies. The other advantage to these type of strategies that deal with that pre-existing immunity is the possibility for redosing. And, and obviously, uh, as Dr. Chamberlain said, we don't know about long-term durability, but obviously there's a commitment by these companies, uh, by the biopharmaceutical uh, community, to make sure those therapies are available when uh, the potential for redosing is, is needed. And then the last uh, area, we're continuing to le leverage our uh, manufacturing platform. We call this Pinnacle PCL. 
Uh, it's a producer cell line system, which is essentially uh, an engineered cell line that will produce the recombinant AAV vector, in this case, UX810, uh, upon a, a, the addition of a genetic switch. So the advantage there is it's a very simple system. It's very robust. We run that at 2,000 liter GMP scale uh, for our early gene therapy pipeline at Autogenics. And we have stability and feasibility data that we could actually go to 10,000 liters. So again, for, for a disease such as Duchenne, where there's high prevalence, high incidence, and high dose, really thinking about that scalability is a critical concern. And um, we believe because it's inherently scalable, uh, sust the sustaining uh, reduction in cost of goods is, is critical for dosing both young patients as well as older older children, and as well, it, it becomes a question of global access as well. Um, I've talked about the preclinical focus on safety, uh, some of the research in the Pinnacle platform. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is our clinical development focus. Uh, obviously, we want to understand the patient population and the various challenges among patients with an aim to reduce, the, the, where possible, the, the viral load, the total vector dose, if you will, to improve safety in older and heavier patients. Uh, the clinical team is actively uh, exploring endpoint strategies to measure uh, clinical, clinically meaningful change in, in patients regardless of disease severity, age, and ambulatory status. And, and consistent with that, we're looking for a broad inclusion criteria as part of our phase one, two, to obviously uh, uh, you know, target both ambulatory and non-ambulatory patients. Um, and, and so just in closing, uh, you know, we're, we're early in this journey, but we're, again, uh, extremely excited. This is a priority program within our gene therapy pipeline. Um, we, uh, again, looking forward to uh, continue to partner with the Duchenne community with each milestone we make. And uh, I would say Ultragenics, uh, again, we're, we're focused on rare disease, multiple modalities, but uh, we have a track record of prioritizing the patient voice and ensuring that's at, at the forefront of our development strategies and uh, commercialization. And that's just really evidenced by um, this young man, uh, Levi, that spoke at our patient rare disease day a couple months ago in Novato. Um, and you know, he and his family told their story. Um, and, and again, the impact upon that, the stories that you and, and your family share is incredibly impactful, uh, humbling, inspiring, and motivating to the, the, the researchers, um, uh, obviously across this panel and the companies that do this work. So again, thank you for sharing and thank you for your time and attention. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alison Lee Wiley, and I'm from Vertex Pharmaceuticals, and I'm also delighted to be here today. Um, I'm actually now going to switch things up um, on you because I'm going to switch from talking about gene therapy and gene replacement therapies for Duchenne and introduce, in a couple of minutes, gene editing. So what is gene editing? You may have heard the term CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And this is really a technology that's under investigation as a therapeutic approach for multiple diseases now, as a way to treat genetic diseases at the root cause of the disease and at the level of the DNA. So how does it work? You can see from the schematic diagram here that CRISPR-Cas9 is built with two different components. One is Cas9 and one is the guide RNA. The way in which we can think about this is the guide RNA is kind of like the GPS of the system. And this is the part of the CRISPR-Cas9 that can find the precise location in the DNA that you want that gene edit to happen. The, the guide RNA can then bring in, in a complex, the Cas9 protein, which is a protein that has a mechanism that that's able to actually cut the DNA at a very specific location. So we can think about the Cas9 as kind of the molecular scissors of the system. Once the DNA is cut, your cell recognizes that it has a, a cut in the DNA, and then it's able to repair that 
to cause a change in the DNA that potentially then has the ability to alter the function of the gene. And in the case of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, obviously we are evaluating a way in which to use this to target the DMD gene and restore dystrophin protein expression. So how are we doing this? Initially, we're doing this for out-of-frame mutations. Um, and as you know, when um, we have an out-of-frame mutation in the DMD gene, then unfortunately, that does not allow the cell to produce dystrophin protein. And we are proposing or we are evaluating using CRISPR-Cas9 to reframe the dystrophin gene, resulting in restoration of dystrophin protein expression. So how do we do that? I'm going to show this in a little bit more detail in the following slides. So what is the reading frame of the gene? So basically, that's where the DNA sequence is split up into triplets that then allows the cell to then read those triplets and make protein. So if we look at this in terms of a sentence that we would all understand, we can think about it as, this is a sentence that says, the sun was hot, but the old man did not get his hat. That's a sentence that we can understand, the cell can understand, and then that allows the cell to then make dystrophin protein. When there's an out-of-frame mutation in the DMD gene, and an example here is a deletion, you can see here how that puts that hypothetical sentence out of frame. So this is an example where there's two letters missing in the sentence, and it's the letters O and L of the word old. And you can see then that what happens when that DNA sequence is split up into triplets, that at the point of that deletion, the sentence no longer makes sense. And when that happens, the cell then can't make dystrophin protein. So what we're proposing and what we're evaluating is whether we can use gene editing and that CRISPR-Cas9 sentence to then restore the reading frame and let the cell then produce dystrophin protein. And the way in which we do this in this example is that we can design the gene editing to have a precise deletion of the letter D. And you can see that that then puts that sentence back in frame. You can then read the sentence. So the sun was hot, but the man did not get his hat. So the, the word old is gone, but the sentence still makes sense. And when that happens, that allows the cell to then produce near full length dystrophin protein. So what's the advantages of this? As mentioned, um, it's precise correction at the level of the DNA of disease-causing mutations. Um, it results in reframing of the dystrophin gene that can restore near full length dystrophin protein. It also maintains natural regulation um, by expressing from the DMD gene itself. So what that means is it allows the DMD gene to work as it would work in nature. So it expresses dystrophin at the right time, at the right levels, and within the right cells. And because we actually have the ability to potentially modify the disease-causing mutations at the level of the DNA, there is the potential that this will have a long-term durable effect. So you might be thinking at this point, this sounds a little like science fiction that you can actually go in and actually edit somebody's DNA. But we have shown through our preclinical studies that this has the potential to be effective. And you can see here that what we've done is we've used our gene editing in a mouse model of DMD. One thing I haven't mentioned is how do we get the gene editing into the cells? And we do this using an AAV vector, much like some of the gene replacement strategies that you've heard about this morning. So in our case, however, the AAV vector brings in the gene editing machinery 
into the cells, into the muscles, where it can then work to make those edits or those molecular scissors can work at the level of the DNA. And you can see here when we do this in mice, we can restore significant and robust levels of near full length dystrophin protein. So what's next? Obviously at this point, we're still in preclinical studies. We're still evaluating this in animals. Um, we're working very quickly to understand and answer questions such as what's the optimal dose? And most importantly, we're evaluating the safety of this approach prior to initiating clinical trials. But the team at Vertex is working extremely hard and we believe that we have the potential and that we're on track to initiate clinical trials within the next few years. So thank you. Okay, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we, we still have a few more minutes. I thought we would take some time to address some of the issues of uh, wh where, where do we stand with gene therapy? Where are we going in the future? Uh, one, one of the things uh, that I thought we could talk about a little bit is, uh, you know, wh where, is, where is gene therapy at the moment in terms of success or, or, or not so good success? Uh, I, surprisingly, I've heard a few people say to me that they don't think that gene therapy is working. And, uh, you know, I would, I would disagree with that, but uh, uh, maybe we could discuss that a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, one runs into in, in developing new technologies, new therapies, is, uh, you know, some things work better than others. Sometimes you run into a problem or a failure in the laboratory. And, uh, you know, what I like to tell the students in my laboratory is is there's no such thing as failure. If you run into a problem, there's a way to solve that problem. If you have challenges, challenges are meant to be overcome, and those are solvable issues. So that's sort of the purpose of development and uh, clinical trials. So uh, maybe, I don't know if anybody wants to address that. Uh, where, does, where, do, where, do, where do you all think that gene therapy stands relative to other technologies or approaches for uh, 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 treatments of Duchenne muscular dystrophy? I mean, maybe we can start with Deanna Sarapta. You guys have several different products in the pipeline and all that. How do you feel gene therapy is, is holding up or, or its long-term potential compared to other approaches to therapy? Yeah, you know, we've had very good success with our first three trials. Um, as I had mentioned, we have over, we have dosed over 80 patients and so far they're doing well. In our 101 study, which was the study with the four initial boys at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we've presented three-year data. Um, we hope to present four-year data on this cohort of participants um, later this year. So we've seen um, very good results from them. We look at the NSAA, the change from baseline over time. In terms of durability, that's one of the big questions that comes up is how long is this gonna last? Um, we're learning that every single day and, and really it's time that's gonna tell us that. In, you know, in looking at you know, our first initial four boys, it appears that the trans gene is still there. We still see a sustained response and their functional benefit. So we have a lot of confidence that we'll continue to replicate those results in not only 102, 103, and then ultimately with our phase three trial. Um, but I feel like we're in a very good place with gene therapy. Um, we still learn a lot. I think all of us who've been in phase one and two, as well as phase three, we learn things, we face challenges, we figure out a way to overcome them. Um, but I think we're in a good place with gene therapy. Olivia? Yes, uh, I mean, I, I fully agree with what you just said, and uh, um, I think we, we, we're seeing a number of challenges and problems, but as someone who's been involved in the field, just as Jeff, for you know, over 25 years, I think what we're seeing in terms of you know, early signs of efficacy is just uh, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, this doesn't compare to anything which has been seen before with Duchenne. Um, so I have a lot of enthusiasm, but also I'm clear on the, the big problem that we face. I mean, it, it, we, have, we are not there yet, right? But something is happening. That's just what I wanted to share with you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to comment? I, I, I'll I, to I, it. So I'll just point out, uh, you know, as Carson and Francesco mentioned, yeah, we, we sort of uh, came into problems, but I, I think it's really important to understand that so there's behind the scenes where we're all working together on this, and, and, and I think it's, um, it, it's really critical for, for you to, to see that and, and, and acknowledge that, that where we're trying not just sort of uh, you know, 
what may appear to be competition, but, but we're working to, to make sure that, that we can, across all the platforms and across gene therapy as a whole, we can really sort of get um, the, the, uh, you know, some of these problems solved to, to give a, as many shots on goal as possible. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I think um, as someone who's been waiting for this for 30 years, I, I think I look at it as potential and promise, right? So potential as bench scientists and drug developers, we, we plan, we, we, we have all the data, we look, but now we're seeing the promise, not just in the Duchenne programs, but look at some of the other programs in rare disease. Hemophilia AAV is out to 10 years now. I mean, if we want to be novel and transformational, it's so exciting, but let's look around and see we're actually accruing data that this is this is going to work. This is it. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I would maybe just add as well, I think, to the question around, you know, where we're at with gene therapy. I mean, it is an evolving field. As you can see, there's extremely promising results. Um, and I think as the field continues to learn, um, from what's, you know, the programs that are in the clinic and then for the ability for that to evolve into something potentially like gene editing, I, I think is just fantastic. I think it's super exciting where this field at is at the moment and I think it will only continue to grow. Okay, so uh, another issue I, I thought we could touch upon is the, the delivery vehicle. So uh, all of these gene therapy programs are using these so-called AAV uh, delivery vehicles. They're essentially a, a shuttle, like a, like a bus, to drive your DNA into the cell. Um, they, the, I think the current vectors we have are not perfect. There's, there's always room for improvement. Uh, and the other thing we've heard today is that uh, the various groups are using different vectors. Uh, there's actually been some recent uh, basic science discoveries over the last year suggesting that there could be ways to make significantly better uh, delivery shuttles to drive genes into muscle. So I, um, we heard a little bit about that today. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that. Uh, I know, Carl, you mentioned a, a new vector in development and ultragenics and, uh, and regenics. Uh, I have some new classes of vectors. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll start, yeah. So our, our 003 program um, is, is, is taking a capsule that, that we sort of looked at and, and evaluated internally, um, you know, sort of uh, this rational design approach, really thinking about what does muscle have and how can we, uh, can we get, get uh, more to the muscle, uh, which is the, the goal. We are not alone by any stretch of the imagination in, in uh, going after this, uh, and, and it's great to see. But I think it sort of comes back to the last question as well. We're at the beginning. Of, of gene therapy and understanding that. So in, in AAV or viral uh, mediated gene therapy, uh, you know, we have to take steps up and, and identify ways to differentiate from that first, first uh, uh, generation of vectors. There's non-viral, there's other approaches that are coming along as well. Um, but but our, ours is, we have a twofold. You know, there, there's uh, other companies out there showing, you know, two to, two to sevenfold uh, increases in muscle. So I, I think we're at the start of, of sort of the next um, um, movement of, of uh, uh, delivery. Anyone else want to? Olivia? No, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I just want to add that, that uh, as Carl just said, that, 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 that there's, a, there's a lot of effort in developing new capsids. Uh, and in the, in the case of very large doses of, AA, of AAV, uh, just uh, an incremental uh, uh, an increment in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the quality of the capsid can be very, very beneficial. That is, if you have a capsid that hits the, the, the skeletal muscle twofold better than the currently used ones, well, you reduce the, full, the, the, the dose by two. And given the huge dose, it's, 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 it can be critical. It can even be critical at the basic level of cost, for instance. So all this work is very important, and it's actually happening. There, there, there are capsids around that are, that are better. They just need to be developed, and, and that takes time. You need mm -hmm. to, that, that takes a lot of time. It takes years to be able to you know, really uh, bring to a patient a, a, a novel capsid, even if, if the, 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 the changes are, are minimal. And if I could comment, I think what you said yesterday with the Exxon Skipper panel was lovely. I think when, when we develop things, the first is very important, but we're also committed to constantly improving ourselves and, and serving the whole community. And as you said, Olivia, sometimes that takes time. 
takes time for us to develop those, test them, make sure they're appropriate, get them into the trials. So um, we're, I think we're all agree that we need to keep doing better and better and uh, keep improving. It just takes time. Yeah, I would just add, you know, there um, some exciting work around the immune modulations that's shown increase in transduction levels, right? So not just on the immune side, but actually impacting uh, some of that innate and adaptive responses can actually lead to even further transduction enhancement. So, you know, I, I think this is a multivariate equation, right? Um, in, increase in, in manufacturing and the quality of those vector preparations. So there's a total, a, a lower total viral uh, load is also very beneficial. So, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, chemical approaches, biophysical approaches to increase uh, biodistribution as well. So, so again, multivariate in each of these, I think, as uh, Dr. Dana said, is, is, is the ability to incrementally improve those transduction efficiencies, um, you know, is, 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 again, I think why we are so excited about, uh, you know, AV gene therapy. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I can add one, one comment, I, I, I think, you know, we're focusing on AAV because this is the one thing that works today. It is very important to do this work. Uh, it has issues. We're going to make progress on that. But I'm not sure what's going to be the vector in 15 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and there, there are other things well, which are non-viral that, that have been out there for many years, and we can see progress being made there, too. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we should, we should keep it keep very open with the technology, and, and uh, uh, we, we, may, we may come up with better ways to introduce genes in the skeletal muscle. Yeah, those are, those are great points. And, and, and I think it's important to remember the the, the delivery vehicle with, you know, what we have now is, is what we have, but there are other ones in development. That potentially could change the accessibility of the patient population, too. I know, I know one of the frustrations is that not all patients are currently eligible for clinical trials. And one of the promises of gene therapy has always been it's something that would work with anyone. And, and we're not quite there yet, unfortunately, but we're getting there. And, uh, you know, I wonder if, if anyone would like to discuss uh, some of the current obstacles. Uh, you know, the, one of the things that limits enrollment in a trial is if you've already been exposed to an AAV uh, in your life and, and you now are immune to it, so you can't uh, receive an AAV a second time. Uh, but there are methods uh, being tested that I think will overcome that. Uh, there's also issues now we've heard with the uh, immune responses against the strophin. Fortunately, it seems to be a very small part of the protein. There are uh, ideas out there to solve that problem, too. Does anyone want to talk a little bit about the time frame or what they see uh, in terms of being able to uh, expand eligibility? I can, I can speak a little bit to that because, you know, as Dr. Chamberlain said, one of the issues is that baseline positivity with the antibodies, and each company has to do their own test to make sure you don't have too many antibodies. So we've partnered with a company um, called Hansa Biosciences, and we're hoping to move this technology into clinic very soon, but essentially they have a drug that can go in and help degrade or kind of lower the antibodies and clear them out so that you can have a dosing window. So that looks to be very promising. There's other technologies that you can, um, you know, there's a company um, from Selecta Biosciences that has a really unique product that you can administer with gene therapy that sends a signal to the immune system that says, okay, don't worry about this dose coming into the body. It'll be okay. Just leave it alone. And that looks very promising. Um, and then we also, I think one of the biggest things that you all have heard are these early mutations in the exons 1 to 17 that all the companies are working very hard to figure out how we can safely administer the drug in that particular set of patients. And that's very important to all of us. And I know we're all working hard to address a safe way to administer gene therapy so that we can be inclusive of those exons. One, one of the other uh, challenges, I would say, with gene therapy, is, as I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction, is, is the size of the dystrophin gene. And, and the current uh, AAV microdystrophin trials are delivering pretty small versions of dystrophin. 
there are a, a variety of ideas out there that I think are really promising to uh, enable the delivery of larger dystrophins, maybe even the entire uh, dystrophin protein. Uh, uh, some of those are at various stages of development. One of them that has potential to do that is gene editing. We heard a little bit about gene editing earlier. Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement around gene editing. It's a newer technology than the gene replacement. It's a little more complex, I would say, and so it's, it's lagging a little behind, but it's coming along. Uh, would you like to speak a little bit uh, from Vertex's point of view of what, what do you see as, as the time frame in terms of, of getting gene editing into the clinic? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so it's a little bit more complex. I think it does have some additional benefits that come with that. As you mentioned, the potential to restore near full length dystrophin proteins. So we at Vertex are working super hard at the moment to do the preclinical studies that we need to do so that we can submit what's called an investigational new drug application to the FDA to allow us to start clinical testing. At the moment, where our program at is that we're on track to file an IND filing sometime next year in 2023, and then we would start clinical de development after that. So although it is um, a, a newer technology um, that's being explored at the moment, um, it's, it's moving very quickly. The field of gene editing is evolving and moving very quickly. There's already clinical trials um, initiated um, Vertex. We actually have experience with ex vivo gene editing for a disease called sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, and we have very promising results from that clinical study. So it's definitely a field that's emerging and emerging very quickly. Okay, we've got only about one minute left. Does anyone want to make any parting comments? I think that I think gene therapy is very exciting. It's been an honor and to work on gene therapy and to bring it forward. Um, it's exciting, as Allison said, the field of gene editing. Um, everything just takes time, and, and sometimes we don't want to we don't want to wait. You know, we want it to be here now. But there's a lot of great things here now, and we hope that in a year from now we'll have even more exciting things to bring. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, I agree with that. I, I, I think there's tremendous promise in this field. Uh, you know, when, when I first started thinking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it was almost 40 years ago for myself, uh, you know, people told me it's, it's an incurable disease. Uh, don't, don't even think about it. Well, fortunately, they were absolutely wrong. This is a curable disease, and progress is coming along tremendously. It's not here quite yet, but we're really getting there in a hurry. So hopefully next year we'll be there.